going to get started in just a couple minutes here. We thank you for joining us. Hang with us here for a couple minutes and we're going to get started. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let all who are discouraged take heart. Let us praise the Lord together and continually. Let's sing together. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord today and even though we are afar we are thankful that we are still together in spirit this beautiful Palm Sunday morning we thank you so much for joining us and we're gonna start out with just a couple of quick announcements and the first one is next Sunday is Easter Sunday and we're actually gonna move service back by 30 minutes we're gonna start at 10 a.m. Uh, next Sunday on Easter Sunday so we hope that you can join us there and then on Good Friday, we will also have a special video posted for you on Friday so you can celebrate and have a time of worship on your own time during Good Friday. So be keeping an eye out for that. We just want to remind everybody that our resource center is open. It's our food bank, and we also have many other items there. We're open Wednesday from 5 to 7 and Thursday and Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., 
We thank you so much for everybody who's donated, and we ask that you continue to donate. And if you'd like to help out with that, please let us know. We're, we're so thankful, we're so grateful that we can be a part of this. We've had lots of people come in this past week, so we're helping people, and that's a good thing. And so thank you to those who've been a part of it. If you have little ones, there is a Mosaic Kids page on our website. So be sure to check that out at mosaicnazarene.org, the kids page. Such a great thing. We have Easter activities for the kiddos that you can pick up uh, during those regular hours that were open for our resource center. Again, that's Wednesday, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., Thursday and Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pick up the Easter activities for the kiddos during those uh, resource center hours. Well, what an interesting time that we are living in today. But we know one thing, we know that God is good and we want to worship Him today. So let's take some time to worship the Lord this Palm Sunday. Amen. Psalm 95, 1 through 3 tells us, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. Your presence, all our 
approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. When anyone asks what you're doing, just say the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Israel, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the ground. Jesus was in the center of the procession. And the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? they asked. The crowd replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from, the Nazareth, from Nazareth in Galilee. flight one day flying across the country 
and the captain suddenly came onto the speaker system and said, we're going to enter a thunderstorm in just a few moments. I'm going to need everyone to return to their seats, fasten their seat belts securely. We're going to ask the flight attendants to discontinue the in-flight service and take their seats and buckle in because this is going to be rough. People were doing exactly as he said when they already hit the storm and the plane started bobbing around like a cork in the ocean, bouncing up and sideways and down, hitting wind shears that dropped him for several feet and then being picked up again and thrown to the top just like they were on the crest of a wave. People were scared. They were frightened. There were a few gasps. There were some people praying. Some were sitting with their hands clenched, fists clenched, gripping the seats, and, and eyes closed. The pastor noticed, though, just across the aisle from him on the other side was a little girl whose feet were tucked up under her and she was reading a book very calmly, like there was nothing happening. He was amazed at her composure. At, after reading for a while, she would unfold her legs and dangle them from the seat, close the book and lean her head back and close her eyes, and then she'd open her eyes again and open the book and start reading again. She seemed to be totally unperturbed by the whole situation. The captain was able to bring the plane in for a safe landing. And as the people were getting off the plane, the pastor leaned over to the little girl and said, pardon me, little girl, could I ask you why you were so calm during that storm? She said, well, you see, my daddy is the pilot and he's taken me home. We have a good, good father, like that little girl's father. We have a good, good father and he cares about what we're going through. We're going to sing about him right now. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think your life, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell Explain it. 
Well, normally this would be about the time that we take an offering. But since we're not here together in person, we just ask that you would continue to remain faithful in your tithes and offerings. Unfortunately, the bills here remain the same, whether we're visiting online together or if we're here in person. But we have different options that you can continue to be a part of financially by the first being you can mail your checks to the church. And we just want to thank everybody who's already been doing that. Thank you so much for continuing to give amidst this interesting season. You can also drop off cash or checks in person during our resource center hours. Wednesday, 5 to 7 p.m., Thursday, Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Currently, our online giving system via credit debit card has been having some technical difficulties, and we're working on that. And so when you do click the Give button on our website, it does give you some different options of giving, online bill pay, mailing, or coming in person. We thank you so much for continuing to give amidst this different time. At this time, I want to go before the Lord as a church family in prayer. And while I know that you aren't here with us, we can pray together and God's Spirit will be present with us as we are unified together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning with a thankful heart this Palm Sunday. But we also come to you, Father, with a heavy heart as there are many people suffering right now whether it's from this virus, whether it's from unemployment, job loss. There's many people impacted by this new season that we so quickly were pushed into. And God, we don't know what to do. Many of us are unsure how to respond, God. And so we simply bow before you and say, God, help us. Be with us, heal our nation be with our families, and protect us. Protect our church, protect our community from this, God. We know that you are the master physician. And Father, forgive us for sometimes forgetting to pray, forgetting that you are all-powerful, that you are God, and that you are the master healer. So God, may we not cower in fear, but May we stand up and rejoice that you are king even over this virus. As we celebrate Palm Sunday, as we read about the triumphal entry, we are reminded that you have triumphed over this virus. And you are the healer, and you are the king. Be with our people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, Paul wrote to Timothy. That's why we can sing, this is amazing grace, because he breaks the power of sin and darkness. Let's sing together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty, so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all
this morning, and I hope that you're comfortable in your own homes, but don't get too comfortable because we will be back together before you know it. And I look forward to next Sunday, Easter Sunday. Join us at 10 a.m., 30 minutes back, 10 a.m., join us right here for a special Easter celebration. We're so thankful this morning. And it's interesting uh, because I was just thinking this week about the very first Palm Sunday. And how that was kind of an unusual event in and of itself. And so even though we may find today to be kind of an unusual gathering of our Mosaic Church family, we're reminded that the very first Palm Sunday was kind of unusual because we find Jesus, this king, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And we're going to talk a a little bit more about that in a minute. And so we're actually in Matthew chapter 21. We read it a few minutes ago. But we're going to just kind of go through Matthew chapter 1 and talk about this triumphal entry story, which is what the, uh, the theme of, of Palm Sunday connects to. It's the story in Scripture where we see people take palm branches, we see them take their cloaks, and they, they put them down on the ground in an act of worship as Jesus goes into Jerusalem for this triumphal entry event. Palm Sunday is the Sunday prior to Easter, and it marks the beginning of what some people would call Holy Week. Um, and so open up to Matthew chapter 21. We're going we're gonna to start in verse, uh, verse 1. And before we start, we, we should just note that we, we find Jesus and his disciples. They're going to a small town called Bethphage. And actually... Uh, we don't know a lot about this town. We know that it's near Bethany. We know that it's on the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives, but actually this town is mentioned nowhere else in Scripture, ironically enough. And so this is where we find Jesus in this small town before this triumphal entry event. And let's read Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. Here's what the Bible says. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. And so maybe you're like me, and you read this, and you think, wow, this is kind of a strange scenario. If you can imagine this, Jesus is essentially telling his disciples, go, and you'll see a donkey, and just go ahead and take the donkey, And if anyone says, what are you doing? Just say, oh, well, God needs it. Does anybody else find this to be a strange scenario? It's interesting. But by this act, we are reminded that sometimes God calls us to do things that don't always make sense at the time. I mean, if I was one of these disciples, I would say, Jesus, this really doesn't make sense. Why are we doing this? But sometimes that's what God calls us to do. Things that seem kind of strange. Things that don't really make a whole lot of sense. And that's kind of where we find the church on Palm Sunday 2020, thrust into this 
way of doing things that is kind of strange and doesn't always make sense. I'm not sure if the disciples questioned Jesus and asked him why in the world they would go and do this. But one of the big themes in this story is this idea that God many times works in unusual ways. And we are reminded this Palm Sunday that God is going to work in some very unusual ways as we're able to reach different and new people via the internet. Since Jesus had just arrived in town prior to this triumphal entry, he would have no time to secure a rental animal to ride on. And so this whole thing is kind of happening last minute. The disciples are trusting Jesus, they're trusting God the Father to arrange this donkey being taken in last minute. That's why it's kind of happening like this. That's why this scenario is taking place here. And actually, if we jump to Mark 11, we don't have the words here, but if you jump to Mark 11, Mark describes the story as well in verses 5 and 6. Here's what Mark 11, 5 and 6 say. They say, as the disciples were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. And so we know that um, as the disciples tried to take this colt and take this donkey and bring them to Jesus, people were saying, you know, what are you doing? The disciples said, well, God needs it. Jesus needs it. And that seemed to work. Um, so interestingly enough, and actually, uh, if you read commentaries, there's lots of discussion on it. The Gospel of Mark does not mention two animals being taken. Matthew does. Matthew mentions two animals being taken. The Gospel of Mark mentions just one animal being taken. So just an interesting side note there. And it's why it's good to read all of the Gospels together um, as, we, as we read stories in the Gospels. Because just like how uh, many different eyewitness accounts will be a little bit different, but if we combine them, we can get a complete picture so in the Gospels, as we read the different stories in the different Gospels, it gives us a complete picture of what was actually happening. And so we can safely assume that the disciples did, in fact, bring two different donkeys to Jesus. And it kind of begs the question, and you may or may not be interested in this question, but I was interested. Why would Jesus need two different animals? Why would Jesus need a donkey and a colt uh, to ride in on? And so I just dug around a little bit and did some research and for those of you that are interested. Some suggest that perhaps the older donkey was used to make the younger donkey feel more comfortable and obedient, so it would be uh, more able to carry Jesus into town. It's also suggested that Jesus used both, one after another, the donkey representing the Jews under the burden of the law, and the colt, the untamed Gentiles. Just something I read, interestingly enough. But the big point of all of this, the big point of the Palm Sunday story, and what I want to kind of hit on today, is that Jesus was not the stereotypical king. Jesus was not the stereotypical political leader. And sometimes God leads us in such a way that doesn't really make sense at the time being. If you were a worshiper of Jesus back then, if you were one of his disciples, maybe things were a little confusing. Why is Jesus riding into town on a donkey? Let's jump into verses 4 and 5 here, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this. So we're in Matthew chapter 21, verses 4 and 5. And so why is all this happening? Well, here's a quote that uh, Matthew says in 4 and 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And if you want to dig into that prophecy, which I recommend you do, it's in Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9, the second half, and it's this whole prophecy about how the Messiah would come for his grand entrance. And it's just so interesting that this whole occurrence fulfills this Old Testament prophecy, which happened so long ago. It fulfills it so precisely. The king who rides on a donkey. It's really an oxymoron. It really doesn't make sense. Because typically, back then, kings would ride in on horses, on the most powerful of horses. You know, it was kind of like driving a vehicle. Would somebody important be driving 
in a, say, 1993 Corolla. No, they would be in a limousine or they would be in a fancy sports car. And that's why Jesus riding in on this little donkey didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like, who is this king that is so humble, that is so like you and me, that he wouldn't be driving into town, so to speak, on the most expensive and fancy mode of transportation possible? What is happening here? Donkeys, as a means of transportation, were reserved for the poor folks, for the less important folks. And so what is Jesus trying to say here? What is he trying to teach us by riding into town on a donkey? This is important. This is important. Because Jesus was not the stereotypical king. Jesus was not the stereotypical ruler. And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing because Jesus came as a suffering servant that he may provide the one true ultimate sacrifice for us. But it didn't make sense at the time. It didn't make sense to anybody. Why would a king come riding on a poor person's mode of transportation? But Jesus, as we know, Jesus was not the typical important person. Jesus Jesus was somebody who spent time with the poor, with the lowly, with the outcast. And actually, he was somebody who was rejected by religious leaders, rejected by political figures and authority. But through all this, he became one of the most important historical figures of all time. Through all of this, we see King Jesus come and remain the most central figure in our faith. Jesus Christ, God, the Messiah coming in. But it was kind of different at the time because nobody was expecting this to happen. So let's read verses 6 through 8 out of Matthew chapter 1. We'll continue the story, verses 6 through 8. So the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And so here's Jesus riding into Jerusalem. You can just imagine it in your own head, can't you? He's riding on this little donkey, and there's all sorts of people all around putting their cloaks down laying down the palm branches. This was an act of worship. This was an act of reverence. People were excited about his coming. People were excited. The laying down of cloaks, the laying down of palm branches was an act of worship. And that's why we uh, typically, we wave palm branches around on Palm Sunday. Perhaps we'll lay the palm branches down on the altar. We do this to remind us of this very interesting story in Scripture, this very interesting entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, Jesus coming, being proclaimed as king. The irony is that this triumphal entry marks the beginning of what would end up being his death and resurrection, which we will talk more about this weekend. But this triumphal entry was so unusual Jesus on a donkey, representing a suffering servant who is to eventually be killed, but eventually resurrected. Let's read verse 9. Verse 9 describes what the crowds were doing. Here's what it says. It says, The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, why were they screaming Hosanna? Hosanna is an expression of adoration, an expression of praise, an expression of joy. God with us. And that's why we sang Hosanna so many times this morning. Reminds us of these people, these God followers so many years ago, proclaiming Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna on Palm Sunday, the very first Palm Sunday so many years ago. They took their cloaks, they took their palm branches, and they laid them down before the feet of Jesus. And that reference of son of David, they were 
referencing Jesus to be son of David. What does that mean? That term is reserved for the Messiah, the predicted, the expected, the awaited Messiah, son of David, who has come to save the world. But it's so ironic, it's so unusual, because the Savior is riding in on a donkey destined to be crucified on a cross. How crazy and unusual is this? But it just makes Easter Sunday all the more special and all the more powerful as we see God work in this unusual, unexpected way, as he often does and as he is perhaps doing now amongst our churches. Let's read verse 10. Verse 10 is so interesting. Let's read verse 10. It says this. It says, When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Now, at first, we may gloss over this verse, but it's so interesting because it reminds us there's there's so many people, despite all these palm branches, despite all these cloaks being laid down, there's so many people who say, Who is this? Why is this person riding on a donkey so important? I've never seen him before in my life. Who is this? It reminds us that even though we worship Jesus as king, there are many people out there who say, who is this? What's the point? I don't understand. Who is this? Reminding us that not everybody was worshiping Jesus. Not everybody was proclaiming him as king. He was the suffering servant riding in on a donkey, but there was only some who recognized his kingship. There was only some who realized that this was the Messiah. This was the Savior. In verse 11, the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I love the story of the triumphal entry because it just reminds us how interesting God is sometimes. And you see it all throughout Scripture. It's not just this story. You see God work in some ways that do not make any sense at all. And if you would put yourself into some of these stories in Scripture, you would say, God, why are you doing things this way? It doesn't make sense. God, why is the king riding on a donkey? God, why does nobody know who he is? God, why is he going to go and get crucified? This makes no sense. But this is not unusual for God. God often works in ways that make no sense. And perhaps today we're gathered around our computer screens or our phones or our TVs or however you're watching. We're gathered around and saying, God, this makes no sense. God, why are we doing this? But we are reminded that God works in ways that sometimes don't make sense. And it's so interesting, you know, when we read this story, you just think there was probably so many religious leaders. There was probably so many political leaders who were very important at the time. But we couldn't name their names. We probably never heard of them. The important figure in the story was this person, Jesus, riding in on a donkey, who becomes the most prominent figure in human history and the central figure in Christianity. Jesus Christ, our Savior, the long-awaited Messiah. And so as we're gathered today, many of us suffering, many of us worried, many of us confused, we are reminded that we are not the only ones. And this is not the only moment in the history of Christianity where this has happened. In fact, it's gotten far worse than what we're dealing with now. We're reminded that God doesn't always work in the ways we expect Him to. And we're certainly seeing that here now. But we are hopeful. And we anticipate God working in unusual and new ways through all of this. And we remain hopeful. We remain strong. We remain faithful, knowing that God is in control. He is king. He is king even over the coronavirus. He is king of our lives. And there's nothing that the enemy or society could throw at us that will bring down the work of God. He will continue to work. But we must remain together, even though we're apart. 
We must remain connected even though we're distant. And we must be reminded that while maybe this feels a little weird, or while maybe we are really wishing to be back together, we must remain together through this time. I want to ask everybody to be in touch with each other this week. Maybe there's even one person you could give a phone call to. Maybe it's somebody who isn't really online, but somebody we need to reach out to, to stay connected with. We all have friends in our church. We know each other. Let's stay connected. Call them, text them. Do what you got to do to get a hold of each other and say, how are you doing? How can we be there for you this week? It was so interesting. There was a video shared amongst some of the uh, people in our church. And one of the points in this video, it said that perhaps this whole virus thing, this whole thing that's happening now, Perhaps it is preparing the church for something, giving us a glimpse into what maybe a little bit of the future might look like. You know, not not every church operates the way we do here in the United States. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, the persecuted church, the underground church. They don't always have the privilege of meeting together publicly. But we're reminded that God's still at work. And so maybe this is training us for something, giving us a glimpse into the future for something, helping us get stronger. We're not reliant on any building. We're not reliant on anything except for the Holy Spirit bonding us together in worship. And we are reminded today that God does not work in the ways that we always expect or the ways we always like. But we are still together as a church family. We are still here for each other, and God is still at work just as much as before. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you today, and we give you thanks. We thank you that you are the God of today. You are the king over this coronavirus. You are the God even amidst all these structural changes that are so rapidly taking place in society. God, we know that you can protect us. We know that you are the master healer, the master physician. So God, we pray for a hedge of protection over Mosaic Church, over our people, God, over our community. We pray that we can be the church during this time, that we can continue to help families during this time. God, we give you thanks. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work right now, that you would be with each of our members, especially those who can't be with us online. We pray that you'd feel, that they would feel your presence right now, God. That wherever they're at right now, they would feel your presence. Remind us, God, that you are the unexpected king and that many times and in many ways you work in unexpected ways, through unexpected scenarios that are unusual and don't make sense. Remind us of that today, God. Give us strength. Give us encouragement. Give us passion as we continue to be the church this week, as we continue to reach out to each other more so than ever, that we'll call, that we'll text, that we'll we'll be there with each other on social media more so than ever, God, that we can donate, that we can help out in the Mosaic Resource Center, that we can help families in this community more so than ever. We are the church, and we will not be shut down. We are just doing things differently. We give you thanks that you are the God and that you cannot be put in a box, but that you will continue to work through all of this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read our benediction, and then we will be dismissed. This is a vision of the way it can be, the way it should be. Shouts of welcome, a joyful procession, a community celebrating together. The same vision is offered to us today. We welcome Christ into our lives. We celebrate his transforming power. How swiftly things changed back then, how swiftly we too can be distracted. May we hold fast to his vision of goodness, peace from the practice of justice, 
equality from the practice of respect. As this week unfolds, we will let ourselves be overtaken by God's love. We will pour it back out into the world. May the peace of Christ be with you this week. Amen.